from my ideas mm -hmm. and since they're not like completely settled where we can't do like a work division of like all right you draw this and i'll draw that then mm -hmm. we still need to figure out like a couple things and i'm not sure how we're gonna do that yeah you think you're gonna be able to overcome these problems yeah Good. I think, I mean, Zoom is pretty nice and we'll probably do like a group FaceTime chat something. Uh huh. If we're all in the same time zone, I don't think that will be a problem. And even outside of the same time zone, you should be able to do, you know, manage somehow. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. How about others? How are things going studio wise? We'll find out today, I think. Oh yeah. Just because today's our first meeting as a class. So oh, that's we'll see how true. it works Good with point. desk crits and stuff. Yeah. Well, I've been having desk crits with my uh, thesis students and um, if anything, it's been more effective. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. So do you, I, do you I like, hope. do you bring them into like a big class and then separate based on Zoom or how does it work? We use Zoom, and um, we always we're big on the buddy system, so we always have a pair of students at any given time, okay. and um, and so that seems to work. Got it. Um, and uh, they share screens, and I write, I draw right on the screen. Um, there are some pretty impressive um, drawing tools and annotation tools that are part of Zoom. And your studio also work with groups, or are they like individual? Uh, we do we do groups, um, kind of like what we're doing now. Um, so it looks like we have thirteen. Hello. Hi, Hi Jake. Job. And uh, the idea here is that everybody has their video on, if we can do that. Are we still uh, putting a question in the chat? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. But before, before you do that, let's, let's, um, I want to keep the chat more or less tidy. Um, so the first questions I'm asking have to do with um, coping with remote learning uh, in the sudden shift of conditions. Um, how, so my first question is, how is it going? What are the challenges you're facing? Uh, and um, uh, do you think you're, we're going to be able to manage this? And you can respond. Um, just by answering with your mic on or in the chat, however you feel comfortable. And this is just to get a full quorum. We're up to 16, so we're almost up to speed, but uh, how, are, how are things going studio-wise for everybody? I will talk about my studio. So we had like class yesterday uh -huh. and like, um, I'm somehow confused about the like the discussions because like uh, you can share your screen, but like the professor, if like she wants to give you like uh, like some comments, like she like you know we used to like go over tracing paper and sketch and that stuff, and this is not available right now, especially like for my studio now it's like the comprehensive studio, so we we are into like the detailing of the wall sections and that stuff and like we need somehow like to be helpful with the sketching but i think like we have to send her like those stuff and then she trace on it and like send it back through email i think this is how it's gonna work yeah have you noticed how um so this is ann borst Right. Oh, wow. uh, your instructor is Anne Forrest. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are tools uh, available when 
when we're sharing screens, we can actually draw on the screen. Anyone who's in the chat. Oh, really? How can yeah. Um, so um, when we're sharing screen, um, those tools become available. So uh -huh. um, maybe you can figure that out. And um, yeah. like during the slideshow, for example, when I start sharing my screen and start showing slides, mm -hmm. anyone who wants can actually draw on the slide oh. uh, by turning on the annotation tools. Okay. We maybe try that just as a way to support. Um, yeah, I will, I will try to figure out this. And I think you'll notice that um, just comparing Wednesday's optional class to today's uh, class, you'll notice a big improvement in my ability to use these tools, these Zoom tools. Like all of a sudden, I'm in a controlled environment to start with where the noise, thankfully, is um, controlled. I don't have, I'm not eating breakfast while I um, manage the class. Um, but also, I, I know a lot more about how Zoom works. So, so hopefully this will, will work today. So other people, are, who's... Uh, so let's... Um, I'm going to... Do does everyone see the chat option at the bottom of the uh, control bar strip? Yeah. If you can turn on the chat, um, and um, and do you see uh, quick reaction buttons? Yes, no, go slower, go faster, more. Do you see those quick reaction buttons in the chat window? Um, no. No. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you guys are all seeing, but here's, um, let's see. As soon as I shared my screen, it changed completely. Um, No. So here's an example of um, things I don't understand. So I seem to have lost my control panel. You have to go up and like stop uh, sharing and then go back. But I want to show you my control panel. Oh. Uh because you have to be selective about which screen are you sharing. Yeah, I thought I'd um, selected the proper screen. So are you seeing the grid with all of you in it, in my shared screen? No. Oh, it's your desktop. So what's on my desktop? Your WhatsApp and then your emails. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could just like take a screenshot of the screen before you share it and then share the screenshot off your screen. Oh, that's a good idea. So um, what do you see now? Do you see my view of you guys? Uh, same thing still. Same thing, yeah. Oh, really? Okay, that's instructive. Now, what do you see? Nothing, just all of us. It's just a regular. Now, what do you see? Me? Yes, no. No. WhatsApp, chat. No. What's the same thing. You see my WhatsApp? Yeah. Yeah.
well we are up to 21 so maybe uh, I will just consider this and um, try to figure out what's happening but what I was trying to do was show you the how to access the chat does anyone see the chat Olivia do you see the chat How did you show this chat? I just clicked the chat button in the bottom middle of the window. Does everyone see that? But there's no reactions like you were talking about. So. Um, do you see the oh, participant you, list? Yeah, if you click participants after you click chat, then it comes. Okay. And it also lets you raise your hand and stuff. Perfect. That's what I would like to get everyone to do. So, Olivia, can you uh, teach us how to do that? Mm, yes. Can I do this? So, I first, you can see what you guys are seeing. Are you first able to you share your screen? It. Yeah. Let me see. I have two screens. Um, I can't share my Zoom screen. So you're running into the same problem I had? Yeah. On the top of my screen, it just said you are looking at the screen. Yeah, but you can't, like, I can't share the Zoom screen that I'm looking at well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, like, go in the middle once you're in gallery view, if you go to the middle bottom and click chat, and then you also click participants, then you can have both of them open. So as soon you, as you would, I see it, yeah. Yeah, and if you exit full screen, it'll collapse them all into a sidebar. And so as soon as you're able to see the participants and the, what do we call that? The quick reaction buttons? Yeah, that's part of the participants tab. It comes in automatically. Yeah. So, chat. so please, yeah, so you should have a sidebar that has the participant list and the chat. And when you see both of those things, the participant list and the chat, uh, and you have access to those quick reaction buttons, please click the yes button. So Jake's got it, Xavier, Justin, Mo. Danrick, Michael. Okay, it looks like it's working for most people. Wait, so how do you do that again? Olivia, teach us. Okay, I also just, I just put a screenshot. Chat too, if that's helpful. Um, so exit your full screen view and go to like the gallery view and then click the chat button in the bottom middle and click the participants button in the bottom middle and it'll open a sidebar on the right hand side like in the screenshot I sent. Thank you. So Tamara, Matt, Kira, Kai, Faisal, Connor, Z. Olivia, you haven't clicked your yes button yet. I have 15 yeses oh, out of okay, 23. Right, okay. Question. So I click on the chat button, then what happens? I just get this uh, chat box that pops yeah. up. And then click the participant button. Uh, that way you can have them both open. Oh, hello. 
There we go. And Hanjun is giving us um, a keyboard shortcut. If you're on a PC, it's Alt U. If you're on a Mac, I assume it's a Command U. And I'm asking everyone to uh, open your video, start your video so we can see your face. Here we go. Okay. So Kira and Tamara are the two ones who haven't clicked on the yes button yet. Do you two need any help with that? If you're on the mobile app also, I don't think you can do it. Like you have to be on your computer. Oh, okay. I would assume. I don't know. Okay. Once again, thank you, Olivia, for the technical support. Did it work? The um, yes, no? Yes. Perfect. We are 22 out of 23 responding. Um, this is fantastic. So, the second uh, step. Um, I'm going to ask a question and I want everyone to answer um, in the chat. Um, so let's get into it because uh, this is a big topic. And um, so my, my question is, what is the target question you have for the lecture? Given what uh, you encounter, oh wait, let's stop first before that. Let's look at the Prezi. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my laptop screen, uh, but I encourage everyone to uh, look at the, um, the Prezi as well on your own. So what are you seeing in, your, in the screen I'm sharing? The Prezi One submission. Percy. Okay, great. So um, this is the uh, term project Prezi. It's called Zero Zero Transformations City 20. And um, you'll recognize it. It has the familiar four reference points uh, that we've been using all semester. Um, and we see one submission. Jared, do I have permission to show your um, your submission here? Yeah, go ahead. So thank you, Jared. Jared has, um, so the request uh, for Monday is uh, something like this. Um, candidate images and candidate readings for the sketch writing. And Jared has, um, in addition to that, um, Jared has provided a title and he has written a paragraph about um, the ideas that he thinks uh, are worth looking at. And um, I have offered Jared some feedback. Uh, I have highlighted two verbs uh, that um, he has, oh, okay. I've highlighted two verbs that he has used. And um, I'm suggesting uh, reconsidering those those verbs, those action verbs, because this is um, the first, these are the first words people are going to see at the UN when they open up um, our action plan. Uh, deny individually operated automobiles, neglect uh, single use zoning. I think we can be more positive and say, uh, construct uh, alternative, attractive alternatives to single use automobile and um, diversify uses within zones. So, so make positive statements, I think is what I'm suggesting. 
I'm also making suggestions on resources and uh, approaches he could take to the study of Brasilia. And that's available to everyone. Um, I can also um, give the, the predictable uh, response to these images. Um, you know what I would say about this, um, that this is um, a good, a good view in that it shows us architectural scale human activity in the foreground, a larger urban pattern in the background. It might be supplemented by an image like this, but this is not a good candidate for the primary analysis, nor is this as a diagram. This is a, a reasonable supplementary image that you can show. Because it's a diagram, you can show it for five seconds and your audience will see it, will get it. This is a um, this is a good image in that it shows human activity in the foreground, albeit at a, at a little bit too distant, but it's not so great because the larger pattern um, is difficult to read. Uh, this one uh, is a good image in that uh, we can conceivably zoom in and see, picture ourselves in that space. Especially, it shows an open ground plane, which is one of the characteristics of Brasilia, is that the buildings, um, for a long time, the rules were, you must lift the buildings off the ground plane and keep the ground plane free and clear. One of the key principles of Corbusier's um, five points of, arch of modern architecture. Um, so you see the super blocks, you see the trees, you see the boulevards. So this is a, a good image as well. So I can offer those, um, that feedback. Um, as we get into it, I might look at these uh, three resources, but seeing that each of these resources is a website, predictably, uh, I'm going to suggest, especially for a topic like Brasilia, that, um, that Jared, you also look at um, deeper resources, uh, such as are provided by journal articles and books, because Brasilia is such a well-studied topic. There are full books on this topic, and there might be a chapter in a book that um, makes for the most effective uh, sketch writing focus. So first of all, Jared, any questions or comments? Oh, there's questions. You kind of cut out. Oh, there's questions. Okay. And um, any comments? Do does that is that useful feedback? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, other people. Um, does anyone else have any questions about um, how how to move forward with this between now and Monday? So, for the pictures we post, do you want more of? the pictures that we're going to analyze and not the diagrams that we could include? Correct. The, the, the main challenge here is to find a high resolution image with the proper orientation and that satisfies all the, the criteria that uh, we've been applying all semester in our 11 practice analysis exercise. Sounds good. How many pictures are we actually going to be analyzing in this video? One. One, okay. As usual, uh, there's been uneven uh, understanding of this, but the expectation is that you choose very carefully one good high resolution image that simultaneously offers architectural scale human experience in the foreground and the larger um, context of the urban pattern, urban form in the background and that that image is the focus of your analysis and it appears for a minimum of 40 seconds of your 60 second analysis video. Uh, the, the remainder you can have up to 20 seconds of one or more other support images uh, but you have to have uh, the, the argument needs to be carried by the evidence in the single analysis image. Questions? Really? 
If you have a question and you're not comfortable saying it out loud, uh, you can put it in the chat. And I somehow, oh, there it is. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So I wasn't here for like the, the test Zoom meeting. So uh -huh. Did you guys talk about this during that meeting? Like the, this, this Prezi? I don't think we did. So what do you want us to do for Monday on this? Do you want us to upload pictures to this by Monday and have like some research? So by Monday, uh, what we're looking for are candidate images for analysis and candidate mm -hmm. readings for sketch writing. Um, okay. You're not expected to do the analysis by Monday and you're not expected to do the sketch writing by Monday. This stage is to give me a chance to support your choices so that when you invest the time and effort uh, into the sketch writing and the analysis, uh, you're reading something that I have helped you identify as being worth your time and effort. All right. And you are doing an analysis on an image that I have I, I have uh, consulted with you on. Mm -hmm. We can worthy. pick we can pick any topic we will, we'd like. Yes. Well, what you're looking for uh, the challenge here is um, the the UN General Secretary has contacted us and said we would like you to produce a white paper uh, of action steps for towns, municipalities to take all over the world uh, that will shift these conditions and address the challenges of the 21st century. Okay. So your mission is to identify a body of evidence that will actually offer us insights into what we should do. So this is kind of like a combination of everything we've done thus far, but like just one final. Exactly. It's right. an extension of everything you've done so far. I got um, it. All right. Instead of being focused on, let's, you know, between now and Wednesday, we're hoping you will uh, find an image to analyze from the history of cities. Um, and most images are of the current situation. Uh, hopefully you will find an image worthy of analysis that uh, shows how the machine approach to cities can actually offer us insights and help us understand what we should now do collectively. Does that make sense? Crystal clear. Excellent. Uh, if anyone has a question, uh, please uh, say it now or add it to the chat and I will um, either respond uh, for the benefit of everyone or respond to you later. You talked about a list of like past resources that have been used. Do you still have that? And would you share it with us? Yeah, I'm trying to get the most up-to-date version of that from Antonio. Um, I will keep trying. Um, okay. Don't count on it. It's not necessarily, it, it's kind of out of date um, in that um, my excellent colleagues, your excellent instructors seem to share the bibliographies of the courses they took when they were in college. And um, I think uh, there are some excellent resources um, that are more recent than when we okay. all went to school. Yeah. Um, so I'll try, I'll try to get that to everyone um, in some manner. Um, sooner rather than later. Other questions? Okay, so now it's time for the main event. And so I'm going to say um, in the chat, please everyone open the chat. Um, And I'm asking, what are the target questions for this lecture? And Justin, did I, did I unfreeze? Yeah, that was from a while ago. Okay, sorry, I didn't see that right away. Does everyone see the question I put into the chat? Yes. Okay. Yep. 
So now I expect a flood of 22 questions to show up in the chat. So each one of you should enter a target question based on what you uh, learned from the sketch writing. Uh, there were two, two readings, very, two very different readings. One was short and an abstract thing produced by two of our favorite instructors in the program and their classmates at Harvard. Uh, Jen Lee and Rami El Samayi were in class together in Harvard, at Harvard in, um, I can't remember when, but it produced a book uh, that this first reading is taken from, uh, the Roman operating system, which is a very clear expression of urban form acting as a machine for producing certain outcomes. And then the second reading uh, is a, a groundbreaking uh, book written by William Cronin that has gotten a lot of attention over the past two decades because it combines urban history with environmental and landscape history in a very uh, powerful manner to make the point that cities are not just uh, about the city itself. The city is a machine for processing and moving uh, commodities from the vast landscape, if we're talking about Chicago. There's a vast landscape of commodity production from corn to lumber to beef and pork uh, and moving it into the city of Chicago, processing it in the city of Chicago, and then moving it out across the infrastructures of water, rail, and road uh, networks uh, to markets all over the country and all over the world. Um, so Chicago as a machine of commodity processing, production, and uh, distribution. Okay, so how's everyone doing on this? And does everyone uh, have access to their chat screen? Can you see the um, everything that is being offered by your classmates? Yes. So I'm, um, I'm just quickly review the questions that have come in um, thus far. We have, um, is there one size fits all for countries? Can we pick and choose as decision makers? Um, is it more productive moving forward to think of the city and the country together or separate? How can we use civil civilization's desire for power and wealth to implement a higher functioning ecosystem? Uh, what cities, with cities that were built centuries ago, how is it possible to break away from the organizational and programmatic conditions that were laid down, possibly making it harder for growth in today's age, like as we see in Boston? Is there an ability to rely on the city more than the countryside or vice versa? Since each environment is different, um, there cannot be just one absolute answer to the solution, or can there be a universal solution to apply on each cities? Is there a perfect solution developed from the integration of the city and the countryside into a more centralized location? How issues of sustainability, urban regeneration, and economic development are particularly exemplified in cities? Um, uh, so I think we get a theme here. about defining boundaries. So some very good questions here. Okay, you've given me a lot to work with. 
Um, if you haven't yet um, put in a question, please do so. Uh, hopefully you all have access to the chat. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I have 18 in, I think that's a quorum, but uh, keep them coming if you can. Um, so based on those target questions, let me see what I can do uh, in the form of a lecture. So if at any point during the lecture, uh, you have a question, I have a screen open here that should allow me to, um, to see it. I have two methods for seeing it. I have the participant list. Um, I think you can, can you raise your hand? Olivia, is there a way for people to raise their hand if they have a question? Can you see my hand raised now? Oh yeah, yeah. Excellent. So it's right, it's to the left of the yes button. Okay. And then does you have to lower your hand. Does everyone see that? Yeah. You see it. Everybody raise your hand. So I raised my Simon, hand like Simon says raise your hand. Still hasn't gone down. How do you unraise your hand? Yeah, how do you unraise it? You, you click, just click the, on that. Click it one more time. You oh, click it, it says lower, lower hand. hand. <laughs> <laughs> Press the button that says what? So I, I want to see everybody's hand raised. It's like a nightclub. Hands up. Everybody put your hands in the air. So Z and Isa are the ones. Z is stuck on yes. <laughs> And where's David? Isa, where's David? Um, Isa, get David here. Okay. So most of you know how to raise your hand. Okay, you can all put your hands down now. And um, if someone, if one or more people raise their hand during the lecture and I don't see it, please turn on your mic and try that. See if you can break my, break my train of thought. Okay. Does everyone see City as Machine slide one? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So um, here are the topics. Uh, if you were doing a sketch writing uh, version of the lecture, these would be my headings that I'm offering for this lecture. Um, so we're gonna look at Greece, Rome, United States, and uh, expand on the issues raised in the Chicago reading about land economics, transportation, and how architecture is a way of looking at the world that applies to multiple scales. This is the premise of the course. This is the premise of the profession that uh, architecture is not just about buildings. There was a moment in time when architects fiercely defended the right to ignore everything that was not the beautiful aesthetic building. But those days are long gone and I'm happy to report that the profession that we belong to has now embraced enthusiastically the idea of architecture as a way of looking at the world, a way of engaging the world. That is a very powerful method for understanding the world and for proposing uh, <clears throat> actions that have the potential to really make a difference. Um, and it does that by looking at the world uh, at multiple scales, and you are in the comprehensive studio, the way the curtain wall hangs on the edge of the concrete slab is an architectural challenge. 
the way the building sits in relationship to the street is an architectural challenge. And the way the street system lays on the landscape and engages the natural systems and the topography and the drainage and especially the watersheds of the world, these are all um, very important perspectives that are now available to us in this world. Um, and it's part of the scope of what is expected of us as professionals. So Matt, I see you have a hand raised. Oh, we put it down. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I forgot to put it down. Okay. It worked to test the system. Okay. So um, I can't remember if I showed this slide before. Have, I, have you guys seen this before? Doesn't look familiar. So I'm going to uh, use my button to unmute everybody. Did it work? Are you guys doing that or did I do that? We, we have to okay. It sent us all a window that gave us an option. Okay. It says unmute or stay muted. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute everybody because I want to say. Free will, apparently. Have you seen this before? Yeah. What? No. What? Huh? No. 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 no, it was the first time you're showing us. Yeah. So, no, who's, is anyone familiar with this phenomena? Have you driven across the United States? I mean, I've seen it, but I've only, so I haven't it. driven across it. I've only seen pictures of it. Same. So, what's going on here? Why would anyone take a road that goes straight uh, for dozens of miles and then throw this 90 degree turn, two 90 degree turns in the middle of this, what should be an unbroken grid across the country. What's going on here? They had to throw in some change so they didn't fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, but no thanks. How many hundreds of people die each year uh, when they encounter by surprise a sudden 90 degree turn like this? <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. I guess you'd have to do some additional research. Or uh, you could speculate because we are all um, educated professionals. Who has an, an idea? Who has a theory about why this looks the way it looks? I'm guessing that maybe the, the houses were there before the roads were. Good guess. Not correct. I think that also the roads act as like dividing lines and since land is measured like in square units that it's a bunch of squares and then the roads outline everybody's property that is absolutely correct uh, but it why uh, why would so let me just tell you historically uh and by the way we studied this in history theory too historically the grid in this part of the united states was laid down before any humans uh, from Europe of European descent showed up to exploit the, the land. Now, what's your theory? Mm. And there's a hint in the question. Can you repeat it one more time? Uh, when is a map more than just a record of the territory? The, the, the map in this case was laid down first and then the settlement pattern responded to the map. The house was not there until the grid was installed. When there are like habitants, like when, when people start living there then it becomes just more than a territory. Um, I'm going to say no. And I'm going to give you one more hint before I move on uh, that Wait, we're actually, I did I freeze? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. When I freeze, do I, do I then, when I unfreeze, do you hear everything I said while I was frozen? No. 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 Oh, interesting. So um, the grid was laid down first and then the land uses were, established in response to the grid. 
So I'm going to, I'm actually going to let this question float and we will see the answer to this question later on in the lecture. So let's look at Greece. So Greece, um, Greece was actually a bunch of separate city states and um, I'm not able to zoom on this software, but um, it, this is this map is to show that there were a bunch of uh, city states that these separate political entities existed around and on the basis of cities or towns. And the Greek attitude towards the landscape. Um, and you you studied Greek architecture in history theory one, right? Yes. Uh, so you understand the Greek temple uh, and uh, my guess is that you focused on things like temples and theaters, et cetera, um, in this very quick review of Greek architectural history. We're going to look not just at the buildings, but the positioning of the buildings uh, in relationship to the landscape. And so this is an image from Vincent Scully's very famous um, and very excellent book about Greek architecture as a, a, a cultural attitude towards the landscape and the earth and nature. And so um, we see uh, this temple of Adelphi, uh, which is positioned over uh, a geographic feature where methane and ga other gases emitted from the earth would seep into the temple and the, the, the prognosticators of Delphi were basically um, in a trance state uh, induced by these gases. Uh, and they were able to see the future and people would travel here to learn what the future held. And so this was an, uh, the point of this is that it's an architectural response of the temple positioned very specifically in the landscape according to uh, these other forces. So it's kind of a machine in the landscape in this way. And so you study the Acropolis uh, uh, and the Parthenon um, uh, at, the, at the top of the Acropolis, at the center of the city of Athens. Uh, and these, these, these buildings are each important elements of a larger system of Greek urbanism, that uh, the purposes of each of these are, are very specific and uh, the associations that we have between Greek culture and as the birthplace of democracy uh, has to do with uh, these cultural uh, institutions of how people manage uh, governance uh, of the city-state uh, back in Greek times. And so it's a reference point that we have access to because it was preserved uh, in the libraries of Islam uh, through the, the Middle Ages. Uh, and we still refer to the democratic institutions that were established in Greek uh, society. And we have a sense of the agora um, or the agora uh, as a place of democratic exchange. Um, and so the, the agora is a machine for democracy uh, in a way. And the theater as a gathering place for as many people as possible in one place, the opposite of what we're doing now, the opposite of social distancing, but it's a machine for putting as many humans as possible in the same place at the same time and still be able to hear a speaker without, there is no microphone, there's no sound system. It is the acoustic attributes of the architecture that make this possible and also simultaneously limits uh, the number of people who can be positioned in this one place. The other thing that's going on here is you see the ruins of a wall that would be the backdrop of the stage. And beyond that wall, uh, part of the formulation is not just the building itself. It is also the landscape behind 
uh, that um, that stage. So um, what we're seeing here is a very specific formal spatial arrangement where the amphitheater is positioned in relationship to the stage, in relationship to the, the proscenium, uh, the, the wall at the back of the stage. And then through that screen of architecture would be the natural world, very specifically arranged for the dramatic presentation of stories that were part of the mechanism of how uh, Greek society uh, adjusted social norms, established and reproduced uh, the rules of proper conduct in society. And uh, whenever we look at histories like this, the question you should be asking yourselves is, how, do, how does that work now? Uh, is this the equivalent of Twitter or other social media, um, the internet? Um, these are important questions that has been at the forefront of the way we teach in this course. We're going back in history, uh, drawing connections between what humans have done in the past and what we do now and what we can do now moving forward. So one of the things that Athens was able to do was to expand and to take over through uh, the famous warfare um, uh, across its region. And it's one thing to conquer and enslave a population. It's another thing to establish a foothold in that location, in that geography. Did I just freeze? Yeah, for a second. Um, so what I was saying is that the, uh, it's one thing to conquer uh, a city-state somewhere in the Mediterranean region. It's a whole nother thing to hold it. And so if you have conquered uh, a city-state and you now need to hold it, who are you going to call? You call the architects. and. Um, you, you bring in the architectural methods for transforming the society and making it Greek. And you do that with uh, the city as a machine. You use the grid to tame the landscape. And so here you see um, uh, a grid imposed over the topography, ignoring the topography itself. Uh, it's a bold, move of taking a diagram and imposing it on something that already has a very strong character in and of itself. And so this is uh, the Greek strategy of placing grids on onto the landscape and building cities accordingly. And so here we see uh, a vis an artist's visualization of Athens. Um, we're going to get more into the specific components of this strategy when we get into the Roman system. But just so you see, uh, it's very closely related to the conversation we were having on Wednesday, in which you see the general fabric of uh, Athens is housing. And you can tell that by the texture and scale of the architecture. But inserted into that, uh, that general grid of housing, we see very specifically um, these other shared elements that are uh, available uh, and that really define the collective functions of everything. And so we're going to see that even more in the Roman operating system. So it's interesting to note that Rome itself, because it, it was originated and developed and expanded uh, in small increments over a, several centuries, that it looks like a total mess. Uh, it might as well be Caracas, right? It has a sense of low slung chaos of the housing neighborhoods with these insertions of large institutional uh, elements into that fabric. Um, and long story short, um, the seven hills of Rome that were there at the origins of the city 
were the opposite of what we're talking about. There was not a grid imposed on this uh, dramatic topography of Rome. Uh, instead, the street and the streets evolved as they did in Boston. They started out as paths and uh, grew from there. And every once in a while, there's a small grid in, imposed on flat areas, but more or less, this is a chaos of development. So when we talk about the Roman operating system, we're not talking about this. Of course, you recognize this as the Noli map um, from 1772, I think. Uh, Noli depicted, used this very powerful method of uh, uh, representing urban fabric as if it's architecture. It starts with the figure ground, uh, where the solids of the buildings are, are pocheted in black. The open spaces are left white. Uh, the streets are, uh, are part of the line drawing on top of that. But the real innovation here, uh, which goes beyond simply a figure ground drawing with a street grid imposed on it, is that the architectural elements these shared spaces of the architecture are, are shown as figure grounds of the building itself so that we have access, visual access to the interiors of these buildings. This is the Pantheon right there. And so this is another version of that where uh, you're familiar with what a figure ground uh, version of a, of a building plan would be. Well, here's an agglomeration of multiple building plans done in a... Did I freeze again? So this is a, an agglomeration of multiple building plans that uh, are com uh, collaged together to give us an architectural reading of the city. So this is an architectural representation of urban form, a very powerful uh, method for representing uh, fragments of the city. Here's the Roman version of the Greek theater, very much uh, in keeping with the Greek tradition. We have uh, the amphitheater designed for optimal acoustic performance. Uh, we have uh, the backdrop, which is part of that operation. And then, uh, so in the foreground is the urban, the city, the architecture of the city, and through the openings that are strategically placed in this facade, you can see uh, a street and nature beyond. Um, and so this is very much a part of how um, the society, Roman society and Greek society before them, uh, positioned themselves philosophically and uh, as civilization in the natural world, in the wilds that needed to be tamed with our cities. So um, more about just the chaos that is Rome. Uh, and you see here an aqueduct to bring water into the city of Rome to feed water uh, into the system. Wrong direction. Um, Moving quickly, and just to remind us that much later under Sixtus V, the pilgrimage routes were carved into the chaos of Rome, very much in this, uh, what was later expanded on by Hausmann and others, uh, and all the way up to what Jane Jacobs called the radiant Garden City Beautiful. Question. Yes. So when you say they were carved into the city, was stuff removed for the, these to be put in or was it built in the open space? Uh, some of both. Uh, this, the Piazza del Popolo, the Plaza of the People, was a new construction built uh, beyond the walls of the city. But in order to satisfy the pilgrimage uh, needs to op enter the city at the Plaza of the People, and then visually see the pilgrimage destinations down each of these boulevards. These boulevards had to be constructed and carved out of the fabric. So like with all the stuff we're like learning about right now and all the readings where they're suggesting like reorganizing cities and like implementing new strategies within cities, 
would we be like carving this stuff into cities or like building it on top of what's already constructed? Exactly. That is the question. So as we've advanced through this course, we have seen cases where uh, powerful, auto, uh, powerful governments have imposed their authority over the fabric of the city and in so doing displaced large numbers of people. Um, the most recent uh, thing we've looked at right at the beginning of the semester uh, was Medellin, Colombia. In Medellin, they decided that uh, it was not a good strategy to uh, displace people and destroy their homes as a strategy for helping people. And so, uh, uh, and this is one of the hot topics, the key questions of the course. How can we uh, trans use the city as, a, as an instrument for transform social transformation without displacing people, without hurting the very people that we're trying to help? So I'm leaving it as an open-ended question, um, if that's OK. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Rob, can you repeat the last part? That, um, the, the open-ended question for us as uh, a group of professionals trying to use uh, architecture and urban form to, uh, to facilitate and catalyze meaningful social change, how can we uh, manipulate and change the urban fabric without displacing and thus harming the actual people that we're trying to help? Thank you. We're starting out from a position of great uh, disadvantage because historically, architects and planners have been the tools of autocratic regimes for doing great harm to the urban majority. Uh, historically, people like us show up and it's bad news. Uh, we're basically showing up to survey a neighborhood so that everyone can be displaced and big projects can be put in place. And even when we're not displacing people, we are altering land values that gentrify. So, pausing for internet disruption and back. Um, that, so we're at a disadvantage. People already don't trust architects. So bear that in mind. Um, so this is just a reminder of things that happen much, much later uh, that we've already talked about, um, uh, that these diagonal boulevards are cutting through the chaotic fabric and sometimes cutting through the grid structures that are imposed uh, in some places. So back to the question, what did the Romans do uh, with this grid technology, this grid method for uh, conquest and uh, capturing the hearts and minds of the city-states uh, because the, the Romans took these cues from the Greek playbook and they said, well, it worked for the Greeks. Let's um, build on top of what the Greek experience was. So step one, and this was very clearly described uh, in, a, in a clever way in the first reading, uh, established the Roman operating system, which is a grid. Uh, when I was in Montana, uh, the town I was in was exactly this grid. It was a four by four square grid. Uh, and it's uncanny um, how closely the town I was operating within uh, for the past week was exactly this diagram from the Roman city, the Roman operating system that was described by, by Vitruvius 2000 years ago. And so this is the diagram on the left, and this is how it was implemented in uh, Chichester, Silchester, uh, England, uh, during the Roman expansion. Uh, step one, lay out the grid, find a center point of the city. They didn't quite get this right in the Roman operating system reading. Uh, this was not, um, they said in the reading that at some point later, you identify the center of the city uh, somewhere near where the Cardo and Decumanus, the, the primary streets, uh, are come together. No, actually, 
step one, put a rock into the ground and carve on top of it to establish the central station point around which the entire town gets laid out. Um, that is the first step. You identify due north uh, and you establish the Cardo, the main, the center line of the main north-south street. And then you perpendicular to that, you establish the Decumanus, the primary, the center line of the primary east-west street. Uh, and so this is basically, uh, for all intents and purposes, exactly what you see your classmates doing on the Wentworth campus day in, day out, back when we used to go to school in a physical place. They are using the campus as uh, a training ground for doing exactly what these guys did 2,000 years ago. Their instruments use lasers, they uh, have range finders, but uh, for all the sophistication of the technology, they are doing exactly the same thing with tools that are almost identical. Instead of lasers, the Romans used string lines. Um, any questions about how this works? And so once again, we use the work of David McCauley, the architectural graduate of RISD from uh, the 1970s or 80s, and he went on to take his architectural education into the realm of children's books, which have offer us a vivid demonstration of the Roman architectural, the Roman operating system, where you have the Cardo and Decumanus um, uh, crossing at the center of the grid, and then you have the centuriation of the town. Uh, these guys, uh, these soldier, Roman soldiers are called centurions and they centuriate. The first thing they do is they centuriate. Century, centuriation is divide everything up in two hundreds. So it's basically a decimal operation where they are producing these highly ordered uh, centuriation systems of the grid where everything is laid out in a very orderly manner. It starts out as a military camp and evolves from the state as a, of a military camp into a town. And one thing that you should notice here is that there is the central uh, condition of the center of the town laid out in an orthogonal grid with the orthogonal uh, walls. Uh, this is the case of a town built from scratch on the plains, on a flat plain. And where the Cardo and Decumanus meet the town wall, you have a gateway. And from that gateway, uh, the road splits and takes us in a straight line across the landscape to the next nearest towns uh, out of each of the four gates, north, south, east, and west. But even when the road, the main road to the next town cuts across a diagonal, the grid of that town continues. Look at that grid of the town continuing across the landscape in a series of orthogonal plots. We've seen this before. Um, if, if you've seen the Christmas movie with Will Ferrell, uh, Elf, and you see him hopping on the painted lines of the crosswalk, uh, I don't think he ever took this class, so I don't think he knew about this, but it's just built in. Um, that is actually the origins of the, the pedestrian crosswalk. Pausing for internet connection instability. We're back. Um, so this is the origins of the crosswalk. Uh, it is a pedestrian and wheeled cart mobility network simultaneously operating as a drainage system, as is true today. This is more or less the exact same infrastructure that we have today. All roads are simultaneously uh, infrastructure for the movement of foot traffic and wheeled vehicles, and simultaneously they operate as drainage systems. And there it is in the flesh. And the road system of the Roman operating system extended 
out of Rome and across the Mediterranean world uh, to the east, to the south, across North Africa, and northward as far as Scotland. And you notice that uh, the depth, I don't know if you guys are aware of the cross section of the US road standards, but it's about 10 inches deep. It is pathetic and pitiful compared to the European system, which is uh, four times as deep. That's why the infrastructure in Europe lasts longer than the infrastructure in the US. We have a system of built in planned obsolescence, which is part of the US capitalist system. That is not the case uh, in the long term uh, attitudes and viewpoints taken by Europeans when building a similar infrastructure. And even the European system pales in comparison with the Roman system, which goes uh, even twice as deep as the current European system uh, in its road depth. And that's- How does it affect their, their potholes? Exactly. Um, how many of you have run into, well, you guys haven't traveled yet. I'm, I'm not, you may not end up in Europe a lot. But Europe doesn't have the pothole problem that we have, even in countries where they uh, experience below freezing temperatures. They just have different standards for road construction. And here's an example of the Roman road that's still perfectly usable uh, 2,000 years after it was produced. And one of the most fascinating engineering achievements uh, of the Roman operating system is the aqueduct. Um, the aqueduct uh, uses the Roman innovation of arches and vaults. They, um, if the Greek system, if you remember nothing else about uh, the history of architecture of Greece and Rome, the Greeks used a trabeated system. I don't know if you can see me, but my hands are showing a horizontal beam and vertical columns. The Greek system is trabeated. The, the vertical and horizontal structure are uh, are functions performed by two distinct sets of elements. Uh, the Roman system, uh, now my hands are forming an arch. The Roman system, the vertical and the horizontal systems are unified in a vaulted system. So trabeation of the Greeks versus the vaulted system of the Romans, uh, the Romans are able to achieve remarkable things uh, with their arches. One of them is the aqueduct. And it had to be very carefully engineered such that if the water, if the aqueducts don't pitch downward sufficiently, then the water pools and puddles and lays stagnant in the aqueduct. Uh, and the water doesn't flow to where it needs to get and it won't be as pure as it should be. Um, uh, but if it pitches too steeply, it will erode away the mortar uh, of the stone. Um, and so uh, they had to engineer this very carefully in order to maintain a water supply to its towns. And let's see, that, I thought that was going to be an animation that would automatically play. Well, the Roman operating system expanded across the Mediterranean world and its cities. Uh, Rome was the dominant city, but all of these towns uh, basically, they are the origins of the towns of Europe. And uh, we see the Roman core, the gridded core with the Cardo and Decumanus, at the center of European cities wherever the Roman operating system uh, expanded to. Here's uh, an example from North Africa. The reason we love this example is the Romans built this town and then uh, basically, the town was abandoned. So we still see it in its, oh, here's the animation. Here's the Roman operating system, um, starting out in Rome uh, on the seven hills, and it expanded, its power and influence expanded um, into, um, over the course of several centuries uh, to extend to the, boundaries of what is now known as Italy, and then beyond. Uh, they, they conquered through the system of, um, it was basically a military system that there was an incentive 
uh, if your town was captured by the Roman armies, you were given an, a deal. You could either stay and be an impoverished uh, peasant on the land, or you could join the army and go and conquer the next town down the road. Um, and so this was a, a, a pyramid scheme that kept the armies of, uh, of Rome well supplied with soldiers. That ex and this was part of this pyramid scheme that allowed them to expand uh, beyond uh, Europe even uh, to the entire Mediterranean world. Uh, the Scots pushed them back. Um, uh, they were very difficult to, to rule over. And so under Hadrian's uh, rule, they pulled back the forces and built a wall across this narrow part of, of uh, where Scotland. Uh, and the remnants of that wall today, you can hike along the wall. It's a very nice hike. And so basically, um, this is the start of the decline around uh, to, when was it? 253. Um, Constantine uh, converts to Christianity. They expand the empire. Um, the Eastern Empire is stationed in Constantinople, uh, which is currently known as Istanbul, Turkey. Um, Rome, uh, for various reasons, declined uh, over the course of several centuries, uh, receded to the point where Rome was sacked. And the Roman Empire existed in the East longer than it actually existed um, uh, for much longer period than in Italy itself. And so we see this system expanding throughout England, the system of roads. Here are the towns. Here you see uh, often the Roman grid was imposed on an existing town. So it wasn't always as, as clear and diagrammatic as um, the example in the David Macaulay. Here's an example on Lake Como uh, in Italy, where you see very clearly in a more recent image, the original Roman uh, grid, uh, and you can tell where the wall was very clearly. And you see that at the gate at the south of the city, um, that it, um, the southeast of the city, it um, heads off to the next town. Um, and you, here's the Timgad, um, version where you see the diagram and the aerial photo are very uh, closely related. And here's uh, Florence, Italy. Do you see the grid? You see the original Roman core? Okay. Um, take a guess. Uh, trace with your finger on your screen what, a, what the Roman core looks like. Okay. Were you right? Okay, so as the, yes, thank you for using your advanced tools, whoever did that. Um, now, Florence grew beyond its original walls, and at a certain point, the people living outside the walls said, hey, why don't you protect us as well? So they built another wall. Can you, who can draw the outline of the second mm -hmm. wall? Can you repeat like the last thing that you just said? At a certain point, the population of Florence grew and people settled outside its original walls. And at a certain point they said, hey, we're, we're, we deserve protection as well. Let's build a wall around us. Can you see, can you trace the second wall? Someone take a shot. Just grab that pen and, and draw it. Where is this pen thing? I'll do draw it. Uh, in your toolbar, uh, annotate. Okay, that's the fourth wall. Where's the third and second walls? Can you see inside that fourth wall? Can you see other walls? Yes, someone is drawing the second wall. Who's got that white? Who's white and red and green? Uh, me. I got the white. I'm green. Okay. That is the second wall. I was red. Okay. Who's got the third wall? Go red. Close. You see that third wall now? And then the fourth wall. 
So at a certain point, uh, the river itself becomes an important piece of the infrastructure uh, because of its role in transportation. Boats, especially as the Vikings start raiding the cities of Europe, you need to protect your town by building a barricade across the river. Um, now, we always emphasize the role of the walls as a defensive mechanism, but it's also a mechanism of taxation, which brings us to one of the favorite topics of the course, which is what's up with economics? How does the economic system operate uh, in relationship to the form of the city? And that's kind of the focus of, um, of the Chicago and the US. Um, before we move to the U.S., you can see this diagram um, of the grid. If you fly over Italy, or when you fly over Italy, notice that the grid that the Romans laid out 2,000 years ago is still there. And it still is imprinted on the landscape. So let's look at the U.S. Um, on the right, is Los Angeles. There was an, so similar to what we've been looking at, Los Angeles had topography, had very specific uh, architectural elements that were already established in the Spanish mission period. Uh, and, uh, and then even some, some grids that were laid out for the expansion of Los Angeles. But then in a, an explosion of the grid that we looked at in history theory two in that one lecture where we talked about Thomas Jefferson's proposal of 1787 that the grid system be imposed on the uh, the, the landscape of North America. Uh, the land ordinance of 1887 was passed and over the ensuing centuries uh, was implemented. And remember that question we had? We're gonna to get to the answer. It was imposed on um, Manhattan. Pausing for internet connection. Uh, so lower Manhattan was settled by the Dutch. Uh, there was a canal across the river where, uh, across the island where Canal Street is um, to facilitate trade, just as Dutch cities always use canals. And different grids were laid out as the island grew incrementally. But then in 1811, um, uh, before it was justified, um, who, who could imagine that uh, a, the city of New York would expand to cover the entire island of Manhattan? It's uh, folly uh, at the time. Um, but they did it anyway, just as a way of organizing the land and make it easier to commodify the land. Once you put a grid on New York, you get to uh, design your parcel system such that you can design one building and then replicate it uh, thousands and tens of thousands of times. And the one building design will work on every parcel across the entire island of Manhattan. Uh, the same logic was used to conquer, and I'm using the word conquer very specifically, to conquer North America, uh, the land area that has now become United States of America. This is the system uh, de devised by Thomas Jefferson to be imposed across the continent of the United States. And it's a very logical system that is embedded uh, in, we don't see it here in Boston because Boston and Massachusetts was a lot like lower Manhattan. The patterns and uh, uh, meets and bounds system of parcelization were all well established at the time, uh, long before J Jefferson became the second president of the United States. And it's really the lands to the west of the Appalachian Mountains that became uh, the focus of the land ordinance uh, of 1887. Uh, and this system, it's a remarkable system um, that is the basis for uh, the system of acres, the back 40 acres, the 40 acres in the mule deal that was offered to uh, the freed slaves uh, at the end of the Civil War. And we see it 
to the present in every town, just as I was talking about the town I lived in last week. Uh, we see it across the United States. And the surveyors, uh, a small army of surveyors were dispatched across the Appalachian Mountains as the United States expanded. You see these monuments everywhere you go. Uh, now you can notice them. These, uh, that cross at the center is where the centurions would have dropped their plumb bobs uh, hanging from the center of the tripod that they used to survey everything within six miles of, in all four directions of this monument. So every six miles, you have to do this. So back to this picture. Anyone figured it out in the meantime? Is that a hand up, Bradley? What is that? Or is that applause? That's oh, it's applause. applause. OK. Well, thank you. Oh, where's my take a bow button? Um, any guesses? OK. The answer is, oh, it's not there. OK, we'll, we'll get to it. But here's the history of uh, the conquest of the of the continent, it's hard to know about the massive genocide of um, the humans of North America when you grow up in the United States because it is such a difficult story. You kind of have to leave the United States to even see it with any clarity. Um, we're so critical of the coloni colonization of Asia and African countries, the oppression of the populations. Um, but the natives, the First Nations of the United States, if offered that deal, would take it because it's much better than uh, genocide. Um, the 95 million uh, inhabitants of North America, of the 95 million uh, inhabitants of North America at the point, I'm, I'm getting my numbers wrong, 20 million inhabitants, 95% were killed either directly or by disease. And so, um, and, but it was very much, uh, getting back to this course, it was very much a process of using urban form and these grids to tame the landscape and make it possible to extract. We've been talking about extraction economics, uh, first in the uh, context of petroleum and fossil fuels uh, at the beginning of the semester. Um, then moving back into the colonial history, the extraction of silver and gold by the Spanish and Portuguese out of the Americas. And then uh, here we are in North America using the grid system to extract the wealth of the continent um, and uh, the lumber um, that was crucial to the fencing off of the land and allowing ranching, um, the homesteading, uh, the Erie Canal that goes across um, upstate New York uh, was the basis. You can see a necklace of towns along the axis that was formed by the Erie Canal that connected the Great Lakes to the Hudson River and allowed uh, commodities to flow from the Midwest through Chicago, down the Great Lakes, across the Erie Canal, down the Hudson to New York City. And here's another. Uh, picture of that system. And it's similar to the Roman aqueducts. It took remarkable feats of engineering and surveying, not just in the horizontal ground plane of the grid, but also in section. The vertical uh, transformation of the landscape is the key to allowing the canals to do what they need to do through a system of locks. And you would uh, form a town wherever, just as we saw in the factory uh, formation under Industrial Revolution, even before the Industrial Revolution, just to move commodities along these rivers, you would have uh, a system of locks um, that were also available to power things. So um, the great competition of the 18th, early 18th century was we knew that there was going to be one city that dominated the Midwest of the United States. And we knew that it, well, we needed to centralize because of the economics of infrastructure. 
we needed to centralize the flow of commodities in th through one point. And so if you look at a map of the United States, the point that you would choose uh, as being at the center of the system was not Chicago, it was St. Louis. But if St. Louis becomes the, uh, the central node of this great exchange system, then uh, the East Coast dominant city would have been Baltimore, uh, which was already competing favorably with Boston and New York. Uh, and so uh, a bunch of capitalists from New York City invested huge amounts of money to uh, transform Chicago and make Chicago the most important node in the system. They um, Basically, they were looking for a river, a navigable river along the shores of one of the Great Lakes. And uh, the several dozen rivers that drain into the Great Lakes were each the site of uh, speculation. Uh, and people were selling, they were imposing grids and selling uh, lots uh, as, a, as a money-making scheme, which connects us right back to the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Um, land speculation as a financial strategy for making vast amounts of wealth in a very short amount of time based on the market, the rise and fall of markets for land. Um, the winner of all this competition because of the boosterism of the New York City uh, group was Chicago. And once Chicago was established, uh, the Erie Canal was built and Chicago became a part of a system, just as we looked at Batavia in Southeast Asia and Amsterdam as two ends of a singular system, Chicago and New York City were the two ends of a singular system in a very similar way. And so um, let's look at land economics. The diagram of land economics, uh, and we looked at this when uh, we were talking about Los Angeles and the LA School. Um, central place theory, that the highest value is located at the center of this concentric model. And as you move away from that center, the value of the land goes down. Now, different things can alter the, that geometry. If you have uh, extremely uh, productive networks, um, the this concentric model can be distorted by river navigation. And so you start to see the sector model. And if you have uh, multiple centers, uh, dominant center and subordinate centers, as we saw in Los Angeles, you get the multiple nuclei model. And so these are different patterns, um, the most ideal being the concentric zone model. Uh, they get complicated as we introduce highly efficient transportation uh, corridors and multiple centers. And so uh, this is a fundamental principle that uh, accounts for the phenomena of urban formation throughout history. And we're able to look at it straight in the face because of the Chicago model. Um, in the interest of time, uh, this history uh, is is a very deep and rich one in terms of the different technologies, the different building uh, technologies, uh, the networks that allowed the conquest, the arrangements, the Homestead Act, as the uh, First Nations are pushed onto ever less valuable lands, uh, more valuable lands become available for Europeans to conquer and the grid is an instrument of that conquest. Now to the answer to our mystery question. Um, why distort the grid when it's doing such a good job of uh, organizing the land? Um, so here you see the grid across Nebraska. Here's a point every, I don't know, 100 miles or so. Maybe it's 120 miles because it's a base 12 system. You have to, uh, if you've ever sewed, uh, you understand how the tucks work. Maybe this is, here's the clearest. So 
because we're laying a grid, how many of you have ever wrapped a, a soccer ball uh, in Christmas wrapping paper? Okay, Kai's wrapped um, a soccer ball in Christmas wrapping paper? No. Well, one thing you notice is when you put a flat thing, you can imagine when you try to wrap a, a football or a basketball with um, two dimensional wrapping paper, it wrinkles. So the grid shift is the outcome of placing a flat grid on a non flat surface. The reason this, the road has to take a 90 degree turn is because uh, the planet is round. And so you have to adjust the grid to accommodate those distortions north, south, east, west. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everyone push the yes button if that makes sense. Mo, it doesn't make sense? Okay. Great. Um, are Connor and Fi still, still here? Um, and so Chicago itself, Chicago, was nothing uh, and because of its grid it grew into a major city very quickly and because there was this huge flow of raw commodities um, streaming into the city from this vast wealthy very fertile landscape one of the most fertile landscapes uh, in on the planet uh, the the grid of the uh, the vertical grid of the English mill uh, comes into Chicago. Uh, when it rebuilds after the fire, it rebuilds in uh, permanent uh, materials that are less prone to um, to fire, and uh, becomes a factory town for processing the raw materials, and it thrives. And um, we you remember the U.S. Uh, the World Columbian Exposition of 1893, of course. Uh, we've, this is the third time we're mentioning it. Um, but Chicago turns out to be a very clear demonstration of central place theory because there are not many competing towns and centers in the Chicago area. So you take the concentric circle model of the diagram of land value and you cut out the, the part that is Lake Michigan, and you get a very clear concentric pattern of land values. Uh, and upon the grid, the grid of the landscape across uh, the Midwest into the ranching lands is then replicated in the town, in the stockyards, and in the processing plants of the factory system. With the invention of the refrigerated um, uh, railroad car. It uh, used to be that if, uh, if I had a butcher shop in a town, I would uh, buy cattle. Um, the, the cattle rancher would march the cows into town, down the street, and into my, uh, the back of my butcher shop where I would slaughter the cow, cut it up into fresh meat, and sell it in the first few days after slaughtering the cow. Um, and that's the way things happened. Same with pigs and chickens. They would be raised locally and slaughtered locally and consumed locally. Well, with, uh, and this is a theme that stretches to the present, explains climate change to a certain extent. Capitalism hates um, small businesses and there's always more money to be made by concentrating uh, uh, commercial activities in very few hands and in very few locations. So SWIFT is one of the, um, the business interests that becomes more or less a monopoly. They march the pigs or uh, it's cheaper to actually transport the pigs by rail into Chicago where they are slaughtered, uh, packaged, put into refrigerated uh, cars. And so Chicago becomes the butcher shop of the country. 
And so the Chicago Stockyards uh, becomes this massive, uh, vast landscape uh, in the south side of Chicago. When people came to the World Columbian Exposition in 1893, they would uh, visit the World Columbian Exposition first, maybe, and then they would go straight to the Chicago uh, Stockyards to witness this vast sea of uh, animals uh, penned up, ready for the slaughter in these uh, factory slaughterhouses in the foreground. Imagine the smell. Uh, despite the smell, it was a, a great uh, tourist attraction. Uh, here's an interesting uh, architectural mechanism. If you're looking for an example of how a landscape, city, and building all work together as a machine for production. Um, the pigs were raised far enough away from Chicago to justify uh, raising pigs given the value of the land, as very clearly described in the reading. Then um, you put the pigs on a train car, you bring the pigs into the, the city of Chicago, and you march the pigs under their own power to the top of the building. And then you strap them to the wheel and kill them. And the weight of the carcass uh, is, turns the wheel and drives the mechanisms, the conveyor belts, the overhanging um, monorail system where the carcasses hang and uh, the weight of those carcasses is what drives the machinery. You don't need steam power, you don't need water power. It's basically uh, the kinetic energy stored when the pigs march, the potential energy that was stored when the pigs march to the top of the architecture, to the top of the building, then gets trans transferred into kinetic energy as the weight of the carcass drives the machine. Um, itself brilliant and very very dark are the pigs brought alive on the train the pigs are brought alive on the train the pigs are marched alive to the top of the building they are hooked live to the wheel and then and only then when they are at the top of the uh, the greatest potential energy are their throats slit and the dead weight literally is what drives the the, the mechanisms of the slaughterhouse the saws, uh, everything are driven by pig power, by the weight of the pig as it descends in the factory. Brilliant. And so um, the, grid, um, the grid of the landscape of the United States is replicated just as we've been seeing the whole time uh, in the Roman system and the Greek system the grid of the larger landscape that covers the entirety of the metropolitan world, uh, the Mediterranean world uh, in Roman times, becomes the grid that covers the entire landscape uh, of the United States, of the Western states, and is replicated and subdivided down to the point where the pens uh, and then the, the column grid of the architecture itself. Um, so that's the lecture. What did I not cover from the target questions? Um, I think the key challenge here is if, uh, or the key attribute of this lecture is that we see this one architectural strategy, the grid. We've been working with it since freshman year. It's been a powerful organizing feature of every building that you've worked on from freshman studio. At present, your studio instructor keeps telling you around this time of the semester, hey, you need a column grid. Where's your column grid? Am I right? Um, and so it's not just an architectural strategy that's useful at the scale of the building. It has proven to be one of the most powerful instruments for conquest, land commodification, uh, extracting economic value, minimizing the costs of infrastructure, minimizing the cost of buildings, uh, and including the minimization of the cost of design. All we need is one 
tenement building design and we can fill the entirety of Manhattan with uh, the same identical tenement buildings because of the brilliance, the genius that is the grid system. And so the grid is a machine for uh, transforming huge landscapes into machines uh, for building housing, for building factories, for commodifying land, for distributing land, for selling land. The entirety of the Western United States, all the lands in Chicago were sold in an auction house in Boston and New York before anyone who was buying the land had ever been across the Appalachian Mountains. They could do that because every parcel in the city of Chicago was identical to every other parcel in the city of Chicago. Uh, and the, uh, the lands of Oklahoma, the lands of Texas, the lands of all of the Western states could be sold in an auction house, sight unseen, uh, on, in a city on the East Coast, because every 40 acre square of land in the West was assumed to be identical to every other 40 acre uh, square of land in the West. So, it, hey, uh, I had go a ahead. On that. Sure. So, you've called um, Chicago using like that concentric sort of formula rather mm -hmm. than like a multi nuclei. But then you've called like Los Angeles the more like multi nuclei with like the cores kind of spread out. So, like, how did Chicago end up having that more concentric circle, which like I feel like you would see more in cities like Boston or ones that are more like that were before like that kind of parcelization? Well, Boston, you do see it actually. So, that's a that's an excellent insight that, um, Chicago's development was focused on the point of exchange between the Chicago River and Lake Michigan. That was the central point during the canal period. So the closer you could get to the location where uh, the Chicago River uh, drains into Lake Michigan, that point was the maximum value point, something we call um, I forget what we call that. So you may remember, it's the corner of a city that is the highest land value. And the further away you get from that node of exchange between small barges that navigate the Mississippi River uh, and the larger system of the Great Lakes, the higher the value, the more valuable that piece of land is. And nothing else matters until the railroad system comes in. And then the closer you get to the stockyards, the rail yards, wherever there's a point of exchange um, between road rail and river, that becomes that place of highest value. And so there's nothing else in the landscape uh, in Chicago or the middle of the United States that uh, complicates the pattern. In Boston, things get complicated by the fact that you have factories located all along the Charles River. You have factories located wherever there is water power. And then when the railroads come in, you have uh, high value nodes wherever there's a rail crossing the road network, uh, especially where it's close to a center of factory production. So the Boston pattern is a bit more complicated. And then Los Angeles uh, is more complicated still because uh, Los Angeles was born as a uh, a vast a valley filled with suburbs. There were small towns scattered throughout uh, the valley, uh, the central valley of Southern California. And it was only later during the automobile age that Los Angeles became uh, an important economic center. And so it's the logic of water transportation that concentrates uh, uh, activity and land value in one point. The logic of rail creates a slightly more complicated pattern of land value. And then the logic of roads and automobiles that we see in Los Angeles 
complicates it even further. So that's that's my cartoonish um, that's my cartoonish uh, response. The diagram, the short version of that response. So Rob, you were oh. go ahead. You were saying earlier that like investors would come and actually purchase all the land. Is that before or after like the individual like parcels are sold? Like, like would well, investors buy like a hundred acres and then sell like in each acre separately, or how did that? How does the development first begin? Well, the clearest one is Chicago, and uh, if you read the other chapters of William Cronin's book, he goes into great detail. Basically. Every location along the shores of Lake Michigan uh, and elsewhere, every location that could have been a town uh, down the Mississippi River, every one of those locations had a group of men laying out grids and basically gambling that this was going to be the next boom town. And, uh, and what they would do is they would lay out a grid, they would hire a surveyor, they would lay out grids in these several dozen locations uh, along waterways. And then they would send salespeople or they would themselves would go to uh, the land auction houses in New York and Boston and Baltimore and Philadelphia. And they would say, I've got land for sale. And uh, people who wanted to make a quick, a quick dollar they would buy uh, they would buy the land uh, very cheap early in the bidding process and then uh, in the hopes that a week or two or several months or years later that place would be the boom town that was chosen and they would sell it for a hundred times what they paid for it this was a folly in almost every case the one case where it was not a total waste of time and money was chicago and when Chicago took off, you could buy a parcel of land, uh, an urban parcel as part of the grid, or 100 parcels, or several square blocks, which happened in Chicago. You could buy it in the morning for a dollar or $100 or $1,000 and sell it in the afternoon for 10 times that amount because people went crazy, just like tulip bulbs in the Netherlands, uh, et cetera. So who profited from the first transaction? Like who, who actually claimed the land and then sold it? Uh, the land speculators uh, in Chicago are the ones who profited. Um, they, would, they would parcel out, let's say they parceled out a thousand acres or you know, five square blocks, or whatever. Um, they would take five blocks, they would parcel it out and they would offer that for sale. They would keep a quarter of that land themselves in their own hands. Uh, they would sell a bunch, they would sell maybe 10% of it in the morning to establish uh, a market price. And then uh, as the buzz uh, grew, uh, that price would increase. Uh, and by noon, it would be twice. And by two in the afternoon, it might be five times as much. And by the next day, they were uh, in, in the most extreme cases. Um, by the next day, the price would have been you know, much, much higher. And then they could sell their parcels, um, their, the parcel, whatever parcels they were holding on to, they could sell it um, later. And the longer you wait in the context of rapidly rising prices, the more money you make. And this is true, this is the exact situation that we see today in Dubai and in One Dalton, uh, the new condo towers uh, in downtown Boston. It is exactly the same financialization forces that are operating in the grand uh, 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 shift of gentrification of rising rents that you are suffering from and you will continue to suffer as you try to live anywhere close to your jobs, your co-ops, or after you graduate, um, this is what is driving your, your rent costs, is land speculation. It's the exchange value that we've been talking about from the beginning of the semester. 90, it's important to remember that 99% of the original land speculators 
made no money and probably lost you know, their life savings speculating that St. Louis or towns that we've never heard of along the Mississippi River were going to become the primate city of the Midwest. They all went bankrupt. But those who gambled on Chicago got in early. They're the ones who became the Rockefellers and Carnegies of uh, the, golden, the golden age of the 19th century. So do you think at any point the, the land speculation will just plateau and land will just be like a universal cost? Well, that's what happens in every market. Uh, things go up and down. Uh, right now, uh, under the influence of uh, the virus, uh, we can expect um, the economy to crater and um, not just level off, but drop dramatically. So um, uh, all real estate, all land costs of the Boston area uh, will go down or flatten out. But as hard hit as Boston is in this downturn, the rest of the country will be hit much, much more because Boston has uh, a reason to hold its value. It's, uh, it's the hub of financial institutions, of the medical industrial complex and higher education, which is not, uh, historically higher education has been a very stable um, force, uh, a very stable driver of economic development. The whole tech, industry driven by the presence of Harvard and MIT um, is likely to be one of the uh, least harmed and the earliest recovery, uh, the earliest to recover. Um, so Boston is going to fare pretty well, but land markets everywhere else are predicted to drop dramatically. And so if you have a thousand dollars to play with, um, Keep an eye out for when prices hit rock bottom. Buy something at that point, invest in something at that point, and then enjoy the growth from there. That's how financial uh, markets work. That's what, um, and it's important to understand these forces uh, as, a, uh, as insight into why cities look the way they look. Why is the landscape um, doing what it's doing? Why is architecture what architecture is? Other questions? Those are excellent questions. Specifically, are there things that will help you prepare for the analysis uh, on Wednesday? What would be some good uh, places or locations to analyze that we haven't really talked about today? Well, um, given the star of today's uh, show, grids, if there's a, a, a location that, that demonstrates with great clarity um, the power of grids to capture value and to facilitate the extraction of value, um, that would be a winning strategy to look for. That said, no matter what you set out to do, it's important to allow the image to perform the task that it must take. Um, uh, once you choose an image, you're not allowed to force the image to say something you want it to say. You have to stay true to what the evidence actually does allow you to say. Does that make sense? So we've gone over a bit. Anyone who's interested in continuing the conversation the way we would in the physical classroom, uh, please unmute yourself. Um, uh, you can contact uh, me in private by email. You can share your questions on WhatsApp. Uh, you can hang out after class on the Zoom uh, call. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience and flexibility in dealing with uh, this infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice thank you. I, got a, I got a question, Rob. Sure. So you talk when you were answering Brad's question. You kind of talk about bringing value. Can you, can you go into like what you mean by value? Like our uh, analysis. 
Well, the clearest example from the lecture is the grid spreading across the Midwest uh, allowed the rapid, efficient, low cost parcelization of farmland, cattle ranching land, towns, uh, such that, uh, in, and the layout of infrastructure, roads, railroads, uh, everything. And so it allowed in a very short span of a few decades to mobilize, uh, to, to mobilize the extraction of agricultural and uh, commodity value out of the Midwest, the lumber of Wisconsin, and quickly move it into Chicago and then back out again um, to be sold in markets on the East Coast and back in the towns uh, of the Midwest. So distribution, uh, parcelization, extraction of commodity value. There's a giant machine for extraction and, parcel, yeah, and uh, distribution. So I'm speaking in large abstract terms. Your challenge would be to get specific, um, you know, chances are when you look at a specific location, there's one or two commodities that are being extracted by that, uh, that machine of uh, the grid. And it could be extraction, it could be processing as in the image that's on uh, my screen now. What else? So I'm gonna unmute everyone who's left, or I'm gonna request the unmuting of everyone who's left so we can have an open discussion. So I've actually texted you through like regular text, but is it better to use WhatsApp? Yes. Okay. And then I have to find a way, I have to find that screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I found my WhatsApp screen. Can't seem to look at it though. Zoom sits in front of everything. Why don't you use the chat? Because that's what I can see. Okay. And I'm going to turn off my screen sharing. Well, anyone who wants to share their screen, uh, it is an option. You can always grab it if you want to use your screen to um, ask a question. Okay, at the chat. Why don't you just ask your question, Asya? Oh, uh, you sent me an email uh, saying like, you know, if you want to discuss further your um, term project, like text me from this number. Okay. To like yes. arrange a meeting. So does anyone want to discuss the term project for Monday? Because that's the next thing due. That's what I do when I'm a student. I don't care about Wednesday. I like, I'm focused on Monday. Actually, I'm focused on this afternoon. I've got studio. Uh, with that being said, so are we going to have to meet on Monday as well and have a Zoom conversation? No. Okay, so we're only posting our stuff for comments from you. Yes. Okay. Uh, one thing about the Zoom, are you going to send a new code like for each meeting or is it the same code for every meeting? Same code. Should be the same code for every meeting if okay. I know what I'm yeah. doing. Okay. I just have a question about the term project. So thinking about what to analyze, can we use the current situation, like what's going on right now in how it's affecting like infrastructure of the world and economy and maybe how it will bring further like repercussion, like, I don't know, like, how this will yes. affect short answer short answer yes as long as you are able to uh show us 
uh, a piece of architecture, urban form that is operating in a machine-like manner, even if it's not a grid. Uh, what does the machine of uh, the COVID virus look like or the machine for pushing back against the COVID virus? I'm having trouble coming up with uh, a body of visual evidence that would allow me to access that topic uh, using the required mechanisms that are at the core of the methods of this course. In other words, um, you still have to use visual evidence and analysis of that visual evidence to uh, support your argument. You can't just say, well, I want to make an argument about the COVID virus and start arguing it and then maybe show us some pictures. That's what you do in high school. That's what you do in other courses. That is not what you're going to do in this course. This course requires you to start with the evidence itself. We're architects. We start with the physical, formal, spatial reality of the world, and then we use that physical, formal, spatial, institutional arrangement to analyze and, and extract insight out of the evidence of the physical world. That's what we do, we're architects. Save, save uh, the storytelling blah, blah, blah for your humanities and social sciences courses. No offense, humanities and social sciences, but that's not what we do. We start with the architecture. And you, you're only allowed to say it if the architectural evidence allows you to say it. So start with the evidence and um, stay close to the evidence. You're allowed one wild card. Um, you're allowed uh, 20 seconds worth of supporting visual evidence. But the bulk of your 60 second argument needs to be the based on the visual evidence. Do you think um, it's for the term project at least, it's easier to find like the image that we're going to be using and then find the article for the sketch reading? Sketch yes. Reading? Okay. Image first, because I don't know if you guys have noticed, it is so hard to find an image that is high resolution with the proper angle that puts the architecture in the foreground and the urban form in the background, that's, that's a tall order. Yeah, especially if it's like a place outside of US, like, like North America or something. Like for example, um, like Middle East and that kind of places, they don't have like 3D models in the Google Earth or like Google Maps, so it's so hard to find like a good quality picture. Exactly. Um, that's why the tradition of this exercise um, has demonstrated success when you choose the image first and then the topic second. Um, as hard as it is to find the images you need, it has never been easier. We started doing this in 2007, back when the internet was uh, a toddler. And Google Earth was pathetic compared to what it is now. So as, as impossible as it seems, it's never been easier. And it's going to get easier moving forward. But this thing that, um, Kira, you taught me this, right? With your iPad, at least in North America, the ability for Google Earth to allow you to put your camera anywhere you want over a pretty powerful visual uh, representation of uh, at least sites in the United States. Unprecedented. The hundreds of students who tried to do this before us are so jealous of what we have available to us now. So it would be the best type of like analysis if we have like a grid system that we can focus on? Like, is it best that we find a, like a picture with grid that shows like the grid or? or well, the, well uh, the grid is the clearest demonstration uh, that we've been leaning on. The grid is the, the main strategy mm -hmm. uh, that we've been focusing on this week. Um, 
I'm open to other architectural uh, instruments, other architectural strategies for doing what the grid does. You know, these machine-like um, operations uh, to mobilize things and expand. Uh, so there are lots of different architectural strategies, but the grid, if you want to, um, unless you're driven to do something else, um, I suggest the grid, but not just any grid. It needs to be, you need to, when you encounter a grid, first of all, say, hello, grid, how are you doing? And then say, what are you doing, grid? Why are you, why, why are you a grid? And what are you achieving in your gridness? Uh, what is it about, you know, is it the expansion? Is it the extraction? Is it the multiplication of strategies? What is the grid doing in whatever situation you encounter? Okay. Rob. Sure. See you Wednesday, Rob. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stay on until all the questions are answered or the screen is blank. Okay. Thank you, Rob. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, I was just, I just wanted to <laughs> ask you a question. Okay. Um, so, is it okay I if didn't... Tamara hears? yeah it's okay okay <laughs> um i my sketch writing isn't up yet i need like a little bit more time to do it i had to mm -hmm. help my my mom runs a small business mm -hmm. so i had to help her shut it down kind of and pack things up yesterday mm -hmm. and this morning so i just haven't like this thursday friday transitioning into school has been like a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was just i just wanted to let you know that it would be late and it wasn't just because i've I didn't do it. <laughs> Can you write that in the WhatsApp uh, group chat? And then I'll respond by saying something like, um, all late penalties are suspended. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll thanks see for you. your support, your technical support. Yes, of course. All right. I'm going to need it some week. more on Wednesday. Okay, sounds good. I have like a little email that I was putting together for Garrett because he was asking for hints and tricks that we're learning. Uh -huh. So I can send it to you too. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Also, were you when you record your lecture, do you only record your screen or do you record the whole thing? Because he was looking at, he was trying to figure out how to do that. Um, I don't know. This is the first oh. thing I've recorded. So I'll, oh, okay. I'll, I will know that soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. See you guys next week. Okay. Bye, Bye Olivia. Bye. I have one question. Okay, shoot. So about the thing I asked of the situation going on right now yes. for the term project, right? Mm -hmm. So just thinking about home, like we are, we were definitely or are not definitely ready for like this situation. Mm -hmm. So the impact is like the impact not only in health but economically and everything that's bringing to the country. It's maybe because of the infrastructure. Okay. And right now they're making like building places to where people could be placed and things like that so you mean to live new housing no housing but in terms of the health issue like mm -hmm. i don't know i'm just trying to make sense on how could i find a piece of evidence to support a valid like analysis um, um, the rapid expansion 
of the virus itself is happening at a microscopic scale. So that's hard to analyze and it's not part of what we do in architecture and urban form. So I'm not, I'm not seeing the potential there. <gasps> Maybe the response, like um, as the US gears up uh, to um, catch up with the rest of the world in terms of testing, it has to produce lots of tests, it has to produce masks, it has to produce Purell and gloves. Uh, and so there's this massive mobilization of efforts uh, and it's very grid-like, but I don't know what you would look at uh, as evidence for that. Okay. I'll give it a thought and if not, I'll just pick another topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I would say my advice is find a strong image and follow that image wherever it leads you uh, okay. and it might i i doubt if it will lead you to engaging anything about the covid virus okay all right i could be okay. wrong good luck thank you thanks for hanging out thank you all right good luck to Bye. us all <laughs> sorry good luck to us all oh yes Okay. I really enjoyed the class today. Oh, you like doing it from home? I, I've been having a couple classes, but I think it's the first one I actually really liked. And I don't know if it was because it's such a dense like, conversation that being mm -hmm. home with no distractions made me <laughs> like, be more focused. And I don't know, but I, I really liked it. Oh, good, good. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a chance for you to offer feedback to the department and figure out um, how how we can learn lessons from this whole thing. So yeah. share that when the I time will. comes. All right, thank you. All right, bye. All right, bye.